Thank you all for joining us uh, for this panel and workshop. Um, my name is Julian Lute. I'm a consultant for a Great Place to Work Institute. Uh, we are best known in the United States for putting together uh, Fortune Magazine's uh, top 100 places to work uh, in, in America, in the US. Um, and so through that, we get a chance to work with organizations large and small. And it's a privilege to be here today and, and moderate this mini panel. Um, before we get into the, the actual work, hopefully you're in the right spot. Um, how to have remote employees feel included um, and distributed best practices for any work environment. I had an opportunity to chat with my distinguished guests here before we came to the stage this last week, and it, very, very powerful. I was so excited to be here uh, because I, this, what they're gonna share with us are things that are very practical, um, but are also very philosophical, right? So there's a certain mindset that we, that we wanna uh, approach and also appreciate. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna let my folks introduce themselves, and then we'll pop into some questions. Um, so if you all would be so kind as to give your name, uh, and a bit of the origin story about yourself and the organization, uh, that, would be, that would be wonderful. Great, so I'll start. Uh, can you guys hear me? No. Okay, great. No? no. no. Test. Good? Better? Oh, the mic is not on the right way here. How are we gonna do this? How about now? Let's put it higher. Yeah, right there. Right. Remiking. All right, what about now? Better? All right. Okay, David Hassel, I'm David Hassel, the CEO of 15.5. Uh, the company's been around, I'd say, uh, it's about seven years. We incorporated in 2011. And our, we, we started the company with this kind of question of like, how can we use technology to support people in growing, developing, thriving at work, being and becoming their best selves? Uh, so that's, that's really the, the, the um, kind of fundamental why and purpose of the company. Thank you. Um, I'm Lori McLeese, and I am the global head of HR for Automatic. Automatic is the company behind WordPress.com, which is a hosted uh, version of WordPress. And we, I mean, we create software, we create solutions to, to democratize publishing. We want everyone to have a voice. And one of the reasons we're distributed is because we were born from an open source project where everyone was contributing from all over the world. And 13 years ago, when we started the company, we didn't see a reason to actually change that model. That's great. David, how did you all become like a distributed company? How did it turn out that you, know, you have teams and, and how, how are you structured so that that, that actually uh, why is that? Why is that? Yes. Yeah, so, so today we have nearly 40 people. Uh, about a third are in San Francisco. That is our headquarters. That's where the company was founded. But we have about 10 people in the sales office in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have our head of engineering and a small engineering team in New York City. And then another probably 10 engineers in Europe. Um, I actually live between Sedona, Arizona, and San Francisco. And my leadership team, I have uh, customer success and marketing in San Francisco. Uh, sales in Raleigh, North Carolina, VP of Engineering in New York City, uh, my assistant in Eastern, Eastern Washington State, and our head of product in Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it, it was more by necessity at first. Um, my, one of my co-founders moved out from New York to San Francisco when we were first starting the company. We didn't have any money for an office. Uh, I lived in Pack Heights, he lived in Diamond Heights. And after about three months working together, we realized that we never actually even saw each other. We were just sitting in our home offices on Instant Messenger uh, most of the time. And he said, well, I'm just going to move back to New York if that's right. And, <laughs> and, and it actually worked out being great because by, by the time he's, he's a Ukrainian background. And when we decided to extend the team to Eastern Europe, it turned out being in New York was a lot better than being in San Francisco to coordinate with Europe. Uh, and so it just kind of grew out of necessity and convenience. Um, and, and as we'll get into some of these uh, practices today, we had to develop certain practices to ensure that we, ha we created the kind of con connection, human connection, that would just happen by default if you had everyone in the same place. Beautiful. Anything you'd like to add about sort of how you all, I mean, I know you guys came into it through being or open source, but that decision point that you had, I mean, there was a decision point where you're like, we could bring everybody together but we're not, do you, do you, can you talk, expand on like sort of how you decided that it's, it wasn't necessary? 
Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, at first it really was, I mean, when the company started, four people um, working in Europe and Texas and California. And when the company started to grow, it really, it was a, a very deliberate decision not to move to a co-located space because honestly we were, we were worried that we would lose those folks because people didn't want to move to Silicon Valley. They didn't want to uproot their families. Uh, and so we're now over 700 people and it's still working pretty well. So we're going to keep doing it until, until it breaks. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask the audience. Um, how many of you uh, have distributed workforces now, if you'd raise your hands? Wow. Okay, good, good. And if you, if, would you raise your hands if you have maybe f more than 50% of your people outside of your home HQ? No. Wow, okay, so you all understand sort of what we're, what we're talking about, right? Um, one of the things that we talked about, especially during our conversation, was um, the idea of co-locating and sort of why people even do that. What are some of the fears of either leadership um, around having a distributed workforce or how to keep track of a distributed workforce or, you know, are they really working if they're at home in their pajamas, uh, you know, uh, in front of their computer and not on video? Um, so can you talk to us about this idea or the, these fears that, that most people probably experience in their workplace around uh, you know, what happens if you're working in a distributed manner and how you all either conceptually either don't, that, that, that's not the reality, so you don't believe in that, or how you've got over some of those, uh, those hurdles. Yeah, I, I've heard this fear a lot. And, um, and, and, and people ask me about that. We don't really have a, a concern about it. Uh, w one of our core values is grant trust and be transparent. What, what that means for us is that if you're good enough to get beyond our rigorous uh, interview process and get on the team, then we grant you trust. We assume that we assume the best. We <coughs> assume good intention. And since everybody's collaborating and coordinating on some team, you would know if someone wasn't showing up. They're they're interacting all the time. Typically, we use you know between Zoom, Slack, and 15.5. Those are kind of the trifecta of tools that we use to stay in communication. Um, and people are always in constant communication, so we don't worry about that piece. And I would, I would echo what David just said, that um, just because you can see someone doesn't mean that they're actually engaged and working. Um, and, and so we, you know, we set goals as a company. We right. set goals as a team. We document, 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 so that everything's in writing and, you know, I talk to my team, you know, as a team, once a week. I talk to my team members every single day. And so we're talking about, you know, how are we making progress on those goals? And so you can find pretty quickly when someone's not working because they're not reporting back on the, the progress they're, they're making. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I, I love the stories, right? I always want to hear, like, tell me the nitty-gritty details. I feel like... Uh, What's going on below the line, right? Like, what are those things? Um, but, but one thing that when we had our first conversations, we were talking about, um, you know, especially here, we're talking about people bringing their full selves, right? People operating in this way that explores curiosity, allows them to be who they are. Um, and what I hear in some of this talk about having a distributed workforce um, is this sense of like freedom or independence as, as even a conceptual basis for why people need to work together or, or, or work this way. Now, I know that it's also a business strategy and it's a business imperative, but is there any, what are some of the other principles that maybe operate and, and sort of support this idea of having people not all co-located? Are there other principles that apply? I, I think that, um, you know, actually one of our core values is embrace freedom and flexibility. And we actually believe that if we give people that space to be the CEOs of their own lives, they're gonna make the right decisions to be able to take care of their life and their work with us. And if that means that they work better in a co-located facil facility, they can go to the San Francisco office or Rally office or New York office. If they work better alone, we have a number of employees who just work from home offices. Mm. Uh, one of our heads of customer support has four children and she is able to be a mom and, and work for 15.5 and make that all work because she lives at home with her family. Um, so I think that's one of the, definitely one of the principles is, is really giving people, granting people autonomy to choose how they best work and where they best work. Interesting. What about yeah. you? Yeah, I, 
again, I would echo everything that David says and also add that um, we currently have workers in 63 countries around the world. And so it's always someone's work day. And so you can choose the time schedule or the rhythm that really works best for you to be productive. Um, we also have a very high number of employees who aren't really their best selves or they feel like they're their best selves when they're having to physically interact with people. And so this allows them to really control that environment. Um, you know, we do get together once a year, the whole company face to face, and we, we create a space where even if that's not your kind of natural inclination, that we create a space where it feels safe to do so. Um, so I would just say that it, it does allow people incredible freedom uh, to, to be their best selves, whether that's professionally, personally, interacting with, with others or not. So let me ask yeah. another, oh, go ahead. That's a great question. All of our employees are exempt. Uh -huh. So we don't deal with it? <laughs> 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 it's a great question, though. Yeah, well. it's the same. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Currently. Yeah, currently. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Question. That was actually a part of the question I was just going to ask. When you're bringing people into the organization, I just want to broaden it, right? How do you, because it is a very distinct way of working, right? Yeah. There's, a, it's a very, there's a lot of different things that you have to do, especially if you're yeah. used to working with people every single day and whatever that accountability looks like. How do you onboard people into that? And sort of do you provide an off-ramp for folks if, if that's not quite the way that, that they work? I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you go first. Sure. So part of our interview process is actually a paid trial. And that's to allow, and it goes over three to four weeks. It's part time, it's paid, and that allows people to see whether or not they can work in this distributed work environment. Um, we probably about 20% of folks that are invited to trial actually opt out, and we celebrate that decision because we're like, if this isn't a good decision for you, like, great, let's help you find something where you will be more comfortable. For the people that do join us that prefer the company of people on a regular basis, um, we provide a co-working stipend to everyone. And we say, you know, if it's important for you to be around other people, you know, here's the financial means to, to support that. And we also have a lot of in-person opportunities that people can opt into. Um, in addition to the all-company meetup, which we do ask everyone to attend each year. We have team meetups, and we ask that each person attend at least one of those per year. And so they might have more, and then they can either opt out or opt in. Um, and we also have opportunities to come to conferences like this. Uh, I'm here with one of my coworkers, and we're thrilled to see each other for two days. Um, we have word camps, which are opportunities for people um, to learn WordPress. So we do provide those opportunities that if it's important for you to get that face-to-face -face interaction, they are there. What about you, David? You guys have a, how do you make sure people kind of understand how you do things and when you, especially when you bring them in? Yeah, I mean, there, there is some onboarding, but for specific roles, like for example, we wanted to bring on a customer support person who had East, on East Coast time. And so we knew that that was either going to be in one of the offices or remote. It turns out this, this woman's in Vermont, I think, uh, who we just recently hired. And as part of the process, if we know they're going to be working on their own from a home office and whatnot, that's part of what we're sourcing for. Is this person someone who, like, that's how they thrive in that environment? We, we want to find the right match. And, and different people have different ways of working. For me, I, I like a mix of both. Mm. So, like, I like to have, you know, when I'm in... Arizona, I've got a home office, nobody's around. I can get into deep work, right, and go for stretches of time and get, and I can't do that when I'm in the office in San Francisco, right? And then I like to go in the office in San Francisco where I can collaborate with people. So I like a mix. Mm. And, you know, for each person we hire, we look for, well, what's their, you know, what's ideal for them? Mm. So one of the things I see uh, in, my, in my role is a lot of folks believe that if I'm farther away from whatever the home base is or where the base of power is, 
I'm not going to be promoted. I'm not going to be developed. I'm not training is going to be something that I'm going to have to source on my own. Um, how do you ensure? How do you all think about uh, making sure that people feel like they have development opportunities, and, and if there's a career ladder that they're able to take advantage of it, um, and yeah, and, and be able to feel like they're actually making some career progress or challenge uh, challenge themselves in their work. That's a great question. Um, I think Patrick Lencioni wrote something, some book about like three signs of a miserable job or something like that. <laughs> and, and, and one of them was like not being seen, right? So I think it's really important that everybody's on parity, right? That, that you are connecting with everybody on one on ba one basis and, and you're not, you know, preferring just the people who are in the office. One of the ways that we do that is we bring everyone together three times a week on a Zoom meeting and the entire company. And there are opportunities for everyone to interact with everybody. So um, you know, as we'll get into maybe some of, the, some of the specific practices that we do, we run the company as if everybody's distributed, even though there are clumps of people who work in specific offices. So on a, on a Monday morning, you know, all 15 people, if they're in the office in San Francisco, they're all in front of their computers on Zoom, and so are the people in Rally, and so are the people in their remote home offices, and we're all together in that space. Mm -hmm. And we have an opportunity to see each other and talk, and different people get to, get to share, so. How many people do you have total in your organization? We're just shy of 40. Just shy yeah. of 40, okay. Yeah. What about you, Lori? Yeah, and I would say that one of the qualities that we look for when we're hiring at Automatic is um, people that are autonomous and self-starters and, um, like the ability to chart their own course. And with professional development, we encourage people to map out their own journey. And we support that. So if someone says, oh, you know, I really want to learn this coding language and there's this conference, we say, great, go for it. And you know, who else would benefit um, from that at Automatic? Mm -hmm. And so we encourage people to go in pairs or trios and then once they go, we ask every, so there's kind of a trade off. Like if we pay for you to go to a conference um, or an event or a seminar, we ask you to actually write up a summary once you're done. And then it's posted on, we have a learning P2, we have an events P2, uh, I'm sorry, P2 is the name of our internal uh, websites that we use based on WordPress. And um, <laughs> they, uh, and so there's this learning opportunity where people can then say, oh wow, that looks really cool. And then if there's enough interest, we sometimes do internal sessions where the person that went to the conference will come back and like do an internal webinar or list other resources for someone to go, to go learn. So we ask people to be very um, self-starter about career development and then we support them how we can. And we also, my team also does monthly, we call the People Lab series, where if there's a topic that people are interested in, we'll get an expert to come and do a webinar so that everyone can attend, and then we record it so that it's there if people couldn't attend because of time zones. Well, that, what, what I think is really interesting about that is that you're actually helping people facilitate learning outside, mm -hmm. and then because of the distributed nature, you're almost making it a requirement in the sense to like, you have to bring that back to the tribe. You know, you have Absolutely. to you have to bring that bring that water back for, for all of us to like drink from, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that's that's really key. I wonder. So one of the questions that I was thinking of as you all were talking was, um, are there any was has anything been counterintuitive to you in terms of your experience uh, with with a distributed team or having people co you know lo co even in some co locations or you know around the world? Has anything um, sort of shocked you or, or were there any misconceptions that you may have had about what it was was like to potentially work in this manner, things that you thought were going to be issues that either weren't, or things that you didn't think were going to be issues that actually turned out to be issues. I didn't ask you all this during our, uh, during our pre-call, but it was something that came up in the yeah. moment. I, I think for me, I, I was probably one of those people who had the belief that um, culture couldn't be as vibrant and robust if you were all distributed versus in one place. And so that was a surprising thing for, for us to discover because I think we have an incredibly vibrant culture mm -hmm. as an organization, even though we're spread out all over the place. And, and so I think I was surprised, and you know, I talk about it a lot, about hopefully like part, pieces of the formula that's made that possible. Interesting. So during my interview process, my biggest fear was, I love people. I'm going to be all by myself <laughs> in an office, and I won't ever see anyone. Um, and it's actually, 
I, I surprise myself. Like, I really love working remotely. Um, I still have interactions with my team and with everyone else in Automatic on a very regular basis, like constantly throughout the day, I'm doing phone calls or Zoom calls or you know, slacking with, with people. I think the biggest lesson that, counterintuitive, um, it's really scary to be vulnerable in writing on something that everyone in the company can see and that's how you build trust and, and that people are really supportive. And I didn't expect that. Hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting because I always think about, I don't know if you all have this experience where you have a meeting, say it's at 10 o'clock, you have a meeting before the meeting, mm -hmm. and then you have the meeting, and then you have a meeting after the meeting about the meeting. Right, so it seems like you can kind of hide a little bit of whatever your really your intentions really are, or what you think by these pre and post meetings. But what you're saying about how you you know it's very transparent because it's yeah. tougher to do that, and it's not necessarily even the way that work gets done. I would love to not have to have the meeting before the meeting, and then the meeting, <laughs> and then the meeting after the meeting to debrief the meeting, um, and what he said and what she said. <laughs> to, I would love to just put it up on the wall, let it go, and uh, and take it from there. There's a couple questions. We'll we'll let we'll entertain those. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. You both talked about the interview process. Yeah. Um, and obviously your interview was set up to be with the candidate because that's how the company started. You were interviewed Bill. What is the one thing you would most look for in the interview process to say, this person's going to get my trust, and for you, I know you have this kind of challenge with this part-time role. What is the one thing that you said that just, they have to embody this before it's a deal breaker? Did everyone hear the question? Okay. That's good. I get it. So, so for us, I think there's two things that I look for. One is, um, one is that they actually have a connection to what we're about, so the purpose. If, if, if they're actually inspired by what we're doing, and we're not like one of five options and they could take any one, but it's like, no, I really want to work at 50 and 5, and I'm really inspired by what you do, that's number one, because we know that's going to be the, 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 the key for the intrinsic motivation to come through, for them to be... Um, committed to what we're doing and wanting to play a part of that. So I'd say that's one. Actually, this, so yes, one, but there's three. Uh, <laughs> sorry. The, the second would be a growth, learning and growth orientation. So they want to see this role as somewhere where they can learn and grow and develop in their role and maybe further beyond in their career, whether that, that's at 15.5 or not. And the third I look for is uh, an internal locus of control. So what that means is somebody who um, you know, understands that it has that orientation. I guess you could kind of map it to above and below the line a little bit, where it, it's not like life and circumstances are happening to me, but there's a sense of like, I, I take responsibility for my successes and my failures, and I'm willing to look at you know, both of those. And yeah, so those are the three. What about you, Lori? Um, we look, I'm, I'm going to give you three as well. Um, we look for autonomy. So being a self-starter and taking charge and not waiting to be told what to do, but really moving, moving that um, momentum forward. We look for curiosity and a love of learning. And so it's very, you know, if you ever apply to Automatic, one of the questions that you'll get asked is, you know, what books have you read recently? You know, what did you learn from them? What books would you recommend? Because we want to, to understand you know, how, how are people um, learning and expanding their, their knowledge base? And then the, the third thing we look for is how do people take feedback? And so that's part of our trial process is that we give feedback and in a distributed environment, it can be more difficult both to give and to receive feedback, uh, particularly graciously. And so we're looking for people that are either open to that or willing to learn that. Um, yeah. So, so no. let me, let me, I forgot to tell you guys how we were going to run today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we just, we did our panel. I know if you have a question, I would just write it down because we're going to have 10 more minutes at the end of the session to do a proper Q and A, but I love how you all prompted and helped me out actually. Thank you. Cause you had questions that I didn't have on my smartphone. <laughs> um, but what we're going to do now is 
transition into actually the workshop mode. Okay. Um, so we'll give um, our folks, give Lori and David a chance to sort of actually workshop some things with us. And then we'll come back with the last 10 minutes and we'll ask some more questions. And hopefully based on what we've done, there may be some other questions that get generated or a different uh, tenor and tone. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to you all to be able to uh, guide us through. Okay, so um, as Jenny likes to say, like, let's make this interactive. So we're making it interactive. Uh, we'd like for you to get in groups of maybe three or four, so small groups, introduce yourselves, talk about your name, your role, your organization, and then why did you choose to come here? Like, what were you hoping to, to learn from this discussion? And so we'll give you five minutes for that? Yeah, five minutes, group, do this, and then we'll move on to the next question. Ready, go. We actually did a little bit of a, pulled a little bit of an audible in how we're gonna do this because we saw so many questions bubbling up. We don't wanna wait until the end. And we also wanted to give uh, Lori and David a chance to share some of their best practices of how they do things. But we wanted to be responsive to like, what are the things that you're thinking of so we weren't sharing things. And then later you leave saying, geez, I didn't get my, it didn't even respond to my question. Um, so if I could have maybe four people to start and just tell us why you chose this workshop. What did you hope to learn? And we have one in the middle right here. Um, so I uh, work for a company that does support remote employees. There's not a ton of them, but they're open to it. Um, and I thrive working from home. I'm much more productive. I, you know, find a way to be connected to the team that I'm currently working with on a project with video conference calls and stuff. But what I do lack is that larger cultural connection to our organization. And I saw, you know, some of the things that you mentioned where, you know, making an effort to bring all of the organization together at least once a year or, um, you know, supporting going to conferences or, you know, I report to the New York office, but I live in Boston to get them to be open to having me be there, you know, at least once every other month and getting that face time with, with my teams. But I'm wondering if there, if you have any, like, they're all about metrics, right? And it's like, we don't have the budget to get you there. I'm like, it's a train ticket or, you know, it's a conference that can help, um, you know, how, how to start to have that dialogue with, the, with my organization, huge, huge, huge organization. So mm. I'm just wondering if you have any advice on like how to start that conversation. So let me ask this question. So based on her question about like making sure that you're connected, feeling like you're a part of the organization and, them, and, and sort of being able to, you know, get the buy-in from folks to, to invest in your connection. Is there anyone else who has a question that's like tangentially related to that? Is that a similar question? That's a similar question? Okay, so that's a good one. Anyone else? Let's, uh, so that's one question we put it on here. So how do we get all of the org to sort of invest in, in you to be able to make it up there and get that face time? Yeah. So we'll talk about that. There's one right here in the back. Thanks. Um, so one of our core values is connection and to connect. Um, and we've overly relied on our physical space to do that. Um, and that feels like a huge part of our culture, our, our office. Um, and I'm just curious if you have best practices and ideas about how we can kind of move away from that and think about how you can connect with our remote teammates. Um, we've been expanding quite a bit and adding people who don't sit in headquarters, um, and we just haven't intentionally built in those practices to help connect them back. Interesting. So how do you not let the physical space actually be the, the conduit of culture or the, the connector? Okay, okay. Uh, there's, was there one right here that we were looking for? Yeah, I think you raised your hand. Uh, mine is actually specifically back to a question that, or a statement that you made, which was that you um, can see that your culture is thriving, which was something that surprised you. And I'm curious what that looks like in a distributed environment. Like what, uh -huh. what is a thriving culture yeah. in that? That's beautiful. That's great. Question. All right. How and then, do you measure it? Yeah, how do you measure it? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and then let's do one more. I saw one. Let's, yes, with the, uh, the nice suit jacket. Hi there. Um, so we have two, well, you have five offices, but there is a constant division between our Swiss office and our Boston office. Mm. Um, and so I'm wondering how you guys handle, I don't know if this is of scale or anybody else in the room how you guys handle the cultural differences in co-located spaces. Because mm. um, there's a constant division no matter what we do. Cambridge always seems like the cooler place to be um, <laughs> because the Swiss environment in general is much more um, formal. 
Um, so how you guys handle that sort of thing, bringing everyone together on one page. I love it. All right, so we're going to take the first four, and we'll come back around as soon as we, we hit yeah. these. So I know that, let me, let me start off with, I wrote all the questions down, so we'll get to each, each four of those. Um, but I know that there are some things that you all do in general to make sure that there are uh, those connections for folks in the culture. So I'm going to start with David and let us know some of those principles that you all operate with that, yeah. that, you, that, you, that keep your culture thriving. So I, I think one of the things that we believe is that the strength of a, of a culture and the bonds and trust between people is directly correlated to the amount of human-to-human -human connection people have that is not in a work context. Okay, so when you are in an office, that tends to take care of itself, like you have in your space. Uh, when you're completely co-located, usually the default is we're just talking about work, it's all transactional, and we don't end up with that human connection. It's not like I'm just gonna hop on Zoom and there's gonna be someone I'm gonna have like a water cooler conversation. So you have to be really intentional about engineering that. So we also get everyone together once a year. Uh, we get um, teams together for retreats, like you know the customer success team or my leadership team, whatnot. Uh, but what we do, one thing, one thing we do really that I think is really special that still works at 40 people when we get over 50, we may have to start breaking up into subgroups, uh, is something called Question Friday. And most people who uh, might look at it and say, this sounds like a waste of time. So, you know, guys, you're spending 30 minutes on a Friday morning with a whole company doing something that's not work-related. Uh, and we actually think it's probably the, one of the most important things we do as a, as a company to create this cohesiveness. Uh, every month, someone is, is, is uh, basically assigned question master, so that for four weeks, they get on this Zoom call at 9 a.m. on Friday, it's optional, people, a lot of people show up, and they ask a question that's typically personal in nature. And we all get to go around and share about ourselves in some way. And sometimes they're deep, vulnerable questions, sometimes they're more, you know, kind of surface level things. But we really get to learn about each other and, and see the shared humanity across cultures, across offices, across teams. And, and that makes a huge difference. And I think, you know, we've even talked about you know, when we get to 100 or 200 people, we'll probably do like a random generator. So you're always getting different people, but you're not just, just with the people that you're working with. You're still getting a cross section of the whole company. So that's one of the things that we do. And we also have all hands meetings on Monday and Wednesday for different purposes as well. So you really prioritize yes. you know, that face-to-face -face interaction because you believe in that human connection. Exactly. And it doesn't all have to be about work. Right. <laughs> right, right. I need a beer every now and again. Yeah. What exactly. about you, Lori? We, we do the same thing. Like We understand that work is one part of people's lives. And so online, we try to replicate some of the things that happen more organically in a co-located office. So, we have websites that are dedicated to gaming, to music, to pets, to home ownership, to jokes, to puns, you know, all sorts of things. And we have Slack channels for those same things. And um, we have Zoom dance parties where, you know, at a certain time for 10 minutes, we'll get on and just, you know, someone picks some music and we dance. Um, so we're still, awesome. we're creating experiences yeah. for people to connect um, and that's that is important like we, we try to emphasize that work is, is one part of your whole self um, so this this feels like a very enlightened group of people right I mean like Every manager that I work for has never has not thought about it this way that work was the <laughs> like people say that work is the most important thing show up do your time and yeah. then whatever you do later you, you know you do so I, I feel like we have some gurus here so this next set of questions hopefully will push us to the next level um, so let's go back to some of the questions in the audience right um, how do you think about this investment how would someone be able to like you know I, I know you all may think about it a little bit differently but how would you advise someone who's thinking of I want them to invest in me, to come. This is important. It doesn't show up on, on the um, profit and loss statement, but me being engaged with this team, me being engaged with the organization more frequently actually helps me, and it helps the organization. Any advice or maybe any, any practices that you all do to, to sort of support that or facilitate that dialogue? Where do you start? So if they're not responding to the the arguments of, you know, this, me being there in person, where, like, 
especially if you're the only person that's not there, I would actually start kind of the other way around and saying, okay, I need more connection with my team, and so this is how I would like us to run our next meeting, or this is how I would like us so that you are maybe not there in person, but you're being more physically included, whether that's a Zoom conference call instead of you know, the polycom in the middle of the, the table, um, where it's documenting things that, like if someone mentions something that they had in a conversation, you know, walking down the hallway, that you ask, oh, would you mind you know, sending me a summary of that, just to get into practice of being more open and transparent, and then Basically, if you start doing that and you can show how you can add more value when you have access to the knowledge, then perhaps that's a segue into, okay, and now you know, I can add more value if I'm actually there in person and having these connections with my team. Yeah. But it's, this is, a, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish it, it's a challenging conversation if people don't see value in it and to, to invest the money in it. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it sounds like there might be a, a, a mindset or a values mismatch where they don't, they don't necessarily see that. And it reminds me of what Tom was saying about, you know, there's like a, they're coming from the space of knowing where it's all about the numbers and they don't really value that human connection piece. I go to Tom's AMA and talk about how do you get someone in more of that, that learning mode, right, and asking certain questions to try to have them appreciate that, okay, there's actually value here in creating more connection. We're gonna be a higher performing team if we have connection, even periodically. You know, I don't believe we all have to be in the same room all the time, but I actually think having periodic human connection is what creates those bonds. Bonds create trust, trust creates speed, and, and that's uh, you know, just getting someone on board with that mindset. Yeah. I would also add that, I, I talked about this during our, our smaller group around like the narratives, right? So, being, it's part partially collecting these cultural artifacts of like how when I was involved or how when we sort of changed the dynamic of a meeting or an interaction, something good came out of it or something more positive came out of it and being able to retell and tell that story because that's what people like, even if it's metric driven, people also stick those stories in your head. It's like, hey, remember when I came up and how awesome that was and how much fun we had and how that translated back to our next project that we worked on, being able to sort of tell that, that, that story to people um, and find those places to tell that story so that people will actually understand, you know, they may see the metrics, they may look at the numbers, but really it's the emotion that kind of colors it. I think we heard that a little bit earlier today. Uh, let me ask another question based on the question that was asked. The connection to the physical space, that your culture is tied to your physical space. So many people, so many companies are investing in wonderful spaces like this, and these are, facil and they, and these are facilitators of culture. Um, but if you are moving towards a place where you know, people are working outside of the physical space or a physical space, how do you help sort of translate that cultural connection and, and not have it be tied to this building? I'd say that, that that challenge looks a little bit different within automatic is that some teams are the cool teams and that you know they're the they're the ones that always seem to have the best meetups and have the best activities and um, and we really try to approach it from a position of learning and sharing and and also really emphasizing to individuals and to teams that you know this can be whatever you want to make it. So we give people a lot of autonomy, and you know, if, if you want to be what's perceived as you know, the cool team, you know, get it started, because um, you, you have the ability to, to do that. I would say, and we don't, we don't have, we have two physical spaces that we inherited as part of acquisitions, but we have maybe 10 people that work from those two spaces out of 700, and so we don't have that perception of oh, the space is creating the culture. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, we're still a small, growing startup. We haven't had a lot of resources to invest in, you know, top-tier physical space. Um, but we do, we, we do try, to, try to make it, you know, represent our values. Um, and we try to have people cross-pollinate. So we bring people from the rally office to San Francisco, from San Francisco to New York, and, and back and forth to, to have people feel connected to the different centers. Uh, and then if, you know, if people are working in a home office and there are certain things that would make that environment more conducive to them feeling great about their workspace, we're happy to contribute uh, to that. 
I would ask answer two. I've, I've worked with an organization who was making the transition. Um, it's a large global telecom, and they're making the transition from owning workspaces and putting everyone in them to having the more open office concept and allowing people to sort of work from home with restrictions. Uh, but the thing that, they, that they're really trying to do is it's around the mindset, right? So they really took their leaders and, and indoctrinated them and said, look, these are the things that are most important to us. All right, this, and not just the individual employee who already has to do the work, but actually starting with leadership and saying, this is what's most important to us, it's these five things, all right? And finding ways to make sure that when people leave the, the office and the physical space, that they still are culturally connected, right? So whether it is those Friday meetings and you have to be on video conference, like we have to see your face, right, to start the whole cycle. Um, when things happen outside of the office or how, happen outside of the physical space, bringing that in. So asking your people, look, when you guys do your meetups or when you're you know, um, in your distributed locations, send us photos. You know, um, do things that like bring that back to us because if we think that it's all within these four or 22 walls, depending on how many you have here, uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be very tough for us to, to see the value of what you're doing and even see you as a, as a person out there. So trying to find ways to sort of bring those people and that concept back in, but it starts with the leaders. It starts with the managers realizing that it can be true and, and when it's true, it's because we're looking for these five things and not just you being here and the culture is like right here. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, so you asked a you made a, a statement that I think resonated with someone around right. how do you measure thriving when you're in a distributed culture, right? When you're in a building, we yep. can see the water cooler is bubbling, but when you're not, how do you make sure people know that that that, that it's cracking? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and I think when when Jenny started off this morning asking that question about what does a great culture feel like, mm -hmm. you know. We can, map, we, can, we can talk about, you know, culture has a purpose and there's values and we can write down the constructs of what we'd like the culture to embody, but those are just things that point to either the ideal that we want it to be or what it actually is, but there's a feeling of a culture when you walk into a space, when people are together, and yes, if you have different offices, you may end up starting ha to have cultural drift unless, you're, unless you have ways to stay connected. Um, the, the, way, the reason I can feel this in our company is because we actually do all come together on these Zoom meetings and there's a sense of, uh, of positivity and collaboration and excitement and, and connection. And it also comes through in some of the questions we ask in using 15.5 once, in a, you know, once a, a month, I think, we, or once every couple of months we ask a question, how inspired are you by the work we do as a company on a scale of one to 10? And we generally get eights, nines, and tens. And then if there's a six or a seven, I get on the phone with that person and say, okay, well, well what's up? Mm. You know, so we're, we're constantly kind of sourcing for uh, those things uh, on, a, on a regular basis. And I would add to that that um, I feel that our culture is thriving because people feel safe to complain <laughs> and to, to share negative things. Yeah. And to me, like, that's gold. I'm like, yeah, tell me more. Because I, I want to hear, like, what's not working about our work environment? And do you have any ideas about how we can address that? And if not, let's crowdsource it. Let's see what other people think. So that it sounds like you can hear the thriving through, number one, the feedback that you get and being able to, or actually the feedback that you're asking for. You're asking for it, bringing yeah. it to the center, dealing with it. And then also the negative things, the people that are maybe operating below the line, that there is this safety in being able to, to, to talk about it, maybe because they care or because they actually want to see things get better. Now, you said something about cultural drift, right? I think yes. that, that answers another question that was asked about if you have, I think it was about Switzerland, you have a Swiss culture and a Boston culture. Yeah. Um, when you, how would you respond to that? You know, this idea that there are different cultures and some are seen as more of this or less of that. Some are cool or some are not. You kind of went to it, Lori, talking about the different teams, but maybe in your experience, either David or Lori, uh, how have you seen people kind of keep that connection or, or celebrate the differences or however it may manifest? Yeah, it, it's a great, that's a great question as well. I think, I think you tend to, in your, in your case, you have, there's a broader culture in Switzerland and in Boston, right, that that's feeding into the office itself. Uh, we have a lot of engineers in Eastern Europe. And two of the other practices I didn't share about is on Mondays, we do Gratitude Monday. So we start off our morning with a, you know, a, a gratitude meditation or a short thing to, to, res, to, to focus on, and then we go into our numbers. And on Wednesday, we do, we do right? So it's like... You heard that, right? Now we've got to right? snuck that in there. <laughs> 
our numbers and our OKRs. And then on Wednesday, we do Meditation Wednesday. We actually spend, uh, just like on Fridays, there's a, a meditation person who, who is chosen for the month, and they guide us in either a silent or guided meditation. I've told a lot of people this, and they, they said, you know, how do you, you know, our engineers would never go for that. You know, and, and I'm like, well, we've got a bunch of engineers in Eastern Europe, and they're all, they're all bought in. Um, and and I, I think that it, it's because we've made that invitation and we've created opportunities for us all to do something together. So even though, there are, yes, there are differences, we, you know, as an organization, we keep drifting together uh, because the more you have isolation, the more you're going to be prone to that continued separation or drift. So you have to find ways to bring people together and do things together. And, and in, our, you know, in our annual retreat, uh, we do things like that that you know, some people are more comfortable with than others in terms of intimacy and connection. And, but, it, but it gives people a chance to step outside their comfort zones and, and, and have a shared experience. So, Lori, would you, would you have a problem? I would, um, it's very similar in that we, we have kudos and our engineers. But, we're lucky, we're a company of engineers, so they're always building these fabulous tools to use internally, and uh, they build a kudos system where you get three kudos per month to give to coworkers, and if you use all of them, you get one more the next month and one more the next month, and so there's an incentive to give kudos, uh, and those are public to everyone in the company. Like, they show up on your employee profile. Um, so we, we do that. Nice. Um, yeah. So it sounds like we're kind of having to, sometimes we have to force the connection. Like, yeah. if, if you allow people to drift, they will drift, right? Like, moving bodies will continue when they're, That's right. you know. Yeah. But if you, if you allow people, if you find ways to bring things together, people will, will come together. Um, and so let's, we have 10 more minutes left, so let's, or eight more minutes. Let's ask two more questions for now, and then we'll go back. Can we go in the front and then over near the wall, or oh, you see oh, over here? Oh, sure, we'll go over there. And then we'll come back around, yeah. Okay. Hi, so I'm at GitHub. I've got some other hubbers with me as well. Um, and we are a highly distributed company. I would say, I don't know, what do you think? Like 70, 80% of us are distributed. Yeah. We have a couple co-working spaces. And we know through our work with CultureAmp, um, belonging is our number one driver of engagement. So I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how do you create connection and belonging when you are distributed? And we do have opportunities to come together as teams at you know, many summits throughout the year, and once a year we come together as an entire company. But I'm thinking about in the everyday rhythms, like what are those opportunities to create belonging when that means different things to different people, yeah. and everyone's kind of working from home and in their own hours or in their own pajamas or whatever it looks like. <laughs> so I'd love ideas about what you've seen work, anything yeah. that we could take back and, I don't know, experiment with. I think hubbers are really open to experimentation, and I'd yeah. love to just learn a little bit more. Let's answer that while we're here. I yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so we were automatic as a company, which is 700 people, but then our teams are usually 8 to 12 people, so they're much smaller units. And we use CultureAmp as well, and one of the questions that we, um, that we ask is, my team lead cares about me as a person, and we measure that, and that's super important to us because the feeling of belonging often comes from that people care about you. And we have, I mean, we have about 120 team leads or managers within our company, and every team lead goes to an in-person, one week long boot camp about what we expect from, from managers. And part of that is caring about your employees and asking those powerful questions and helping them achieve their goals. Um, so that, that is something that we both measure and prioritize. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just reiterate that, you know, having connection to the higher purpose and then creating a culture of celebration and appreciation, right? Yeah. Celebrating people for great work. We have a similar system in 15.5 called High Fives where people get to give and, give and receive high fives and it goes in a public Slack channel. So we're you know, raising up visibility of great work across the company so people feel connected. So let's go to the front here. We have this question here. Would you, what would you say to senior leaders who believe that 
by people being co-located that that actually is what speeds up innovation and, and help that, that uh, collision, uh, innovation by collision? That's a great question. <laughs> I, so my, my answer probably is not um, very inspiring, but I, I honestly do believe that an organization's culture is often influenced by the leadership, and if they honestly believe that, I'm not sure that remote employees are going to be successful. Um, what you could say is you could point to other examples of companies that have been successful, or case study. I mean, there's a lot out there. You can just Google distributed companies and show that there has been innovation and success. Yeah. Um, however, if they honestly don't believe that, Mm, it may not be the, yeah. You know, and, and there are pros and cons to both yeah. type, you know, both co-located and distributed, right? So, you know, we're able to hire amazing people in rally, paying top wage there, which is less than San Francisco wage, and we were able to make, you know, and, and same with Europe. So we were able to create these win-win situations where we can run our company much more capital efficiently, and be, but we've had to engineer a lot more structure than would just happen if we were co-located. Um, now it's effortless because it's already done, but, but I think, um, you know, you have to know, I would say that you have to know that going in, and again, I would go back to what Laurie said, is look at some of the examples like Automatic and, and, and similar companies that have done it. And I also would say that now more than ever, there are amazing tools that allow you to brainstorm and work together when you're not in the same room together, and so show some of those to them. Like, like, <laughs> so I, I love Zoom as a video conferencing. Um, we also use Trello as you know, project boards. Um, our designers use a whiteboarding tool that I am blanking on the name of it, <laughs> but I will remember it if you want to talk. I, I don't know, <laughs> go ahead. Slack is great. Um, it'll come. Get yeah. <laughs> can I, can I ask a five. question? We have like three and a half minutes left, and we actually have a couple questions that, so I want to give you guys a choice, audience choice, maybe. Sure. Like, we, you, we, we have a, a chance for you guys to get together as a, as a little group again and say, what did you learn? Or we can ask more questions. Yeah. More questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we'll be here for a while, but let's, okay. let's, let's keep going. Um, there was a question here, and then we'll go back there, and yeah. we'll see if we can get them in. Hi, um, so my question is actually similar to the last one that was asked, but I'll ask it in a different way. So we um, have a very pro progressive culture. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, less than 10% of our workforce is either remote or distributed. So I'm curious, and also one other thing of note is when we look at exit data, a lot of people are not leaving to go to other places. They're leaving because they want more freedom um, in location. Oh, wow. And so I'm wondering what can employees uh, do to demonstrate that they are trusted, they're trustworthy to work in this way. Because we are experimenting this with, in the, with uh, working from home, working remotely in some groups, but I think that this is sort of the, um, the edge that we're at. Yeah. I, I would actually turn it around and say, what can the company do to grant more trust? Um, because my experience is that when you grant trust to someone and you give them that autonomy, they're likely going to reciprocate in kind more often than not. Um, as long as there are clear agreements and expectations set at the outset. And I would just add that if, if this really is an experiment and they're trying to figure out like, okay, is this going to work? Really encourage people that are part of the experiment group, do what you say you're going to do. If you're delivering something, you know, you've promised to deliver it by a certain time, deliver it. Over communicate. Like be, be really proactive about <coughs> giving status updates or sharing information before it's asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm putting those structures in place uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So and let's I, go and right And I think back. One, oh, one, one more point on that is I think that the world is moving this way, and especially this younger generation who's grown up with, you know, we have ubiquitous internet, these incredible tools and technology that we can collaborate. Uh, the, the younger generation in the workforce are all saying, like, well, why not? Why can't I work this way, mm -hmm. right? And I think you're going to lose out on the best talent if you're too rigid and don't allow that. That's right. Yeah. So this will be our last question in this forum, but we'll be around for a bit to be able to still a answer yeah. questions. But Definitely. let's give it up to our last person. Last question. <laughs> Hopefully it's a good one. <laughs> um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> exactly. So I've seen a few studies that have 
shown that employees that are remote are more likely to work longer hours mm -hmm. in a form of impression management to really deal with that myth that they're not working, that mm -hmm. they're at their computers in their pajamas. So I'm wondering if you've seen that um, in your employees and if you have how you've combated that. That's a great question. That's a great question. We've definitely seen it. Um, and one of the things that we emphasize with, in our uh, team lead or manager boot camp is signs of burnout and how to set reasonable expectations with your, um, with your team members. We also strongly encourage our employees not to have any work tools on their phones. We don't want them to be available 24-7. We want them to step away from the computer, enjoy time with their family, enjoy time with their children, enjoy their hobbies, try, you know, whatever they can. And so we, we ask them, we're like, you really don't need to have Slack or work email on your phone. Like, if it's an emergency, we'll figure out how to contact you. That's great. I don't have too much to add, but we, you know, Slack is our primary uh, channel of communication, and we do, a lot of people do have those hourly settings on there so that they won't get notifications on off hours. And uh, unless it's you know kind of a real emergency, we tend not to be communicating over uh, after hours and on the weekends. But um, yeah. and we also teach people that um, the sender is not responsible for figuring out the receiver's timeline. And so basically, I might send a message at any time. I usually will preface it with, "Oh, not urgent. Don't respond till." X, Y, Z, or you know, I need an answer in a week, so that even if that someone receives it, particularly in other time zones, if it's like after you know they've already signed off for the day, that they know that they don't need to respond to me. That's great. Yeah. So just to to wrap up, right? One of the things that I think came up a lot is you know, us trying to prove the use case or the business case for why having a distributed workforce matters and, and why it's actually useful or helps innovation. I think that there are some questions that still remain about if you have exempt or non-exempt workers, how do you actually in, encourage that and, and pull them into the fold? Um, it sounds like there's also this thing around trust, this really huge sense of whether it's trust from management and leaders that yes, you are gonna do your work or trust from employees that say, please, can I, be, I can be trusted to do my work and then not have this sort of thing around, around burnout. But one of the, the main things that, I, that, I, that I've heard from both of you is that there is a specific mindset of leaders or of people who believe in a distributed workforce. And that means that people can be trusted that people will do their work. Yes. And, and I think one of the best things, I think Lori said it when I asked, well, how do you know that, that the people are working um, when, when they're working from home? And what did you say, Lori? I said, how do you know they're working if you're sitting right beside them? <laughs> 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 they could totally be playing a game or something. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, touche. You, you got it. You got it. Um, but, but so one of the things I would say as you, as you leave here, there are probably way more questions than, than answers. And we kind of, I think that you all sort of drove us to answer more questions. Uh, but this is something that's going to be a challenge for at least the next decade, 20 years. People are going to be trying to figure this out as much as possible. So I bet you there's a lot of crowdsource knowledge that we can find. And I would, are you all going to be here during? Yeah. So grab them, yeah, snatch them up and tomorrow and talk to them and ask them about what's working. And then if there are problems uh, that you're having, I wouldn't be afraid to share them because they are definitely talking to them super down to earth. And I think they give a lot of good feedback. So if we can give a round of applause to Lori and David. I think there's a little bit of time left between the next session, yeah. uh, so we'll, I think you're dismissed, is All that right? right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's back in here. Yeah, but it's going to yeah. be back in here. So you're dismissed. <laughs>